what I hope to cover in this talk this evening is to give you a picture of what Dulwich was like when war broke out in August 1914, um, what the reaction of the population was, what the reaction of the, the leaders of the community, such as the uh, the local clergy and the local politicians and the mayor, their roles. Also want to talk about the various uh, voluntary territorial um, organizations which were already in existence. And also I want to cover what happened at what was known as Southwark Military Hospital, which you would better know as Dulwich Hospital. And also um, some of the uh, stories of heroes of Dulwich and also some of the stories of the unsung heroes of Dulwich. And I want to refer a bit later on to Private Russell. Uh, there is no great story that, as there was in the Tom Hanks film of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, but I want to explore with you the attitudes of people in 1914, and we will see how it differed perhaps to 1939-45. So um, the first Surrey Rifles, which was the territorial reserve, had been created out of the old militia and volunteers. It had been turned into the TA, as we know it still, in 1908. And when war was declared, the uh, first Surrey Rifles, which was the local TA unit, um, and had its drill hall in Flodden Road in Camberwell, was already at virtually full strength of 1,800 odd uh, soldiers and 25 officers. The first Surrey Rifles had, could trace their history back to the Napoleonic Wars. That's when they, they were founded. Uh, and they became a militia unit in the 1860s. And they fought in the, in the Boer War. And so they, were, uh, they had a long regimental tradition. Now, um, Harry Wall, who was a friend of mine, and who lived at Ash Cottage at the bottom of Court Lane, was in the first Surrey Rifles. And the reason he joined that regiment was because his brother was already a member. And this was the case with many of the residents of Dulwich and of course elsewhere in Britain. People joined up regiments, local regiments, where their relations were in, or their friends were in, their members of their football team were in. In Dulwich's case, it was generally members of what was the St Barnabas Institute. And the St Barnabas Institute today still exists. It's not, it's just the building called St Barnabas Institute, and it's in Townley Road, and it's used by the King's um, Hospital Group as a clinic. But that was the building that was built for the Institute, and 75 members of the Institute were serving in the various regiments, mainly in initially the first Surrey Rifles in the First World War. So um, there was a tremendous enthusiasm to join up. Uh, for example, um, the, the numbers started at, at when war was declared at, at Flodden Road recruiting at 45 a day, but within a week or so, it got up to 250 volunteers signing up uh, per day. And of course, they were not going into the first battalion. That was already, as I said, at full strength. So other battalions were then formed. So the question it begs the question, what actually caused this increasing militarism? Uh, why was there all this enthusiasm to join up in, in such huge numbers? Because it wasn't only for the able-bodied young men like these, but older men were also um, joining other voluntary defence units, which I, I will talk about later. 
Well, there had been increasing militarism throughout Europe in the last two decades of the 19th century. Um, this was, firm, was also uh, stimulated in part by the naval arms race between Germany and Britain to build more and bigger battleships. And so it became a, almost a contest between the great powers. And the young men that joined up went gaily forth uh, into conscription. Uh, soon were, of course, um, dismayed to find that conditions were so terrible as, as they would be, and you will know. So when war was declared, what you see in your screen is what the members of the TA, the Territorial Army, received. They received a mobilization um, uh, letter. There's the envelope. Uh, there's the form and there's the picture uh, of these young men ready to go. And within a few weeks, they were actually in France. And before Christmas, they were engaged in desperate battles of Mons and so on. This is the badge of the first Surrey Rifles, badge worn by so many local people. Um, and this is what it looked like when not the TA, not the territorial members, but the, 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 the other young men who were attracted by the uh, regimental bands and the recruiting and the uh, Kitchener's requests for volunteers. So this is what happened when they went down to Flodden Road, Camberwell. Here they are, fit young men. They were fitter than their generation before because the Boer War volunteers, it had been revealed how unfit they were. Um, there were so many rejects from volunteers in the Boer War that it started a whole uh, range of gymnasiums and um, clubs often organized by the churches uh, for the young men that would get them fit. And by, uh, I'm sorry if you're having trouble with the screen, we're having trouble here, but we'll all come back in a moment, I feel sure. Um, Brian Ford is sharing his screen. I'm not sure how you've done that, Brian, uh, but if you can stop. Thank you. Carry on. Right. So here, so here you see the 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 the, um, the young men that have uh, signed up, and they're under the command of a regular army drill sergeant. They're being put through their paces here, and here they are. Uh, you can see that they've only recently been issued with their uniforms. They are very smart. Look at the look at the um, they're called um, the forage caps or the field service caps. Um, they're all pristine. Uh, all of the battle dresses are new. Look at the young faces. Look at the ones smoking a pipe, trying to look impressive at the age of eighteen. And now our next picture will show them, not the same people probably, but some years later, this is what they look like uh, when probably they came out of, of the line into uh, rest areas. Now, we've therefore spoken about the able-bodied men, young men of 17 or 18 upwards, usually bachelors. Uh, they were all volunteers. But R.G. Newton, who was a local man, came up with the idea of forming what was known as the National Defence League or the Dulwich Defence League. And his idea spread, and it spread really through London. And similar um, organisations 
was started in Wilsdon, Carl Shorten, um, Peckham, Hither Green, all over London. And the idea was that men that were not uh, either young enough to be called up, so they were, they were above military age, or they were in reserved occupations, could feel that they were doing something for the nation, and in the event of an invasion, would in fact act as military. And of course, you can see immediately the similarity between that and the Home Guard. And they had a badge, as you can see here. Um, one was dug up on the golf course a few years ago, and this is what it looked like. Volunteer, it says, uh, Dulwich Defence League, and um, Dulwich and District, and Defend Our Liberty. And now you've got cross rifles. And the A, I think, might stand for A Company. Well, when R.G. Newton um, came up with this idea, he had a public meeting at Lordship Lane Hall, and a thousand men turned up. At its um, largest number, the Dulwich Defence League had 1,500 men in it. If young men joined, like Private Pike in Dad's Army, they would, when they reached the age for entry um, into the regular army, transfer. And they, that was a great thing. That was one, a, one aim of uh, R.G. Newton's plan. So it would enable uh, the, the regular army to be fed by able-bodied young men from the Defence League, while the others who um, were not so able or young enough could still play an important part. They were given jobs like guarding fire stations, fire hydrants, um, anything where there might be fifth columnists at work. It kept morale up. And now here's a really grainy um, um, newspaper photograph showing a review um, by uh, uh, Colonel Campbell, um, uh, Colonel Campbell, I think, is on the left in the bowler hat. And the Major General, who was a friend of his in school with, uh, is marching past these men. Now, you can look at the men and you can see they are typical dad's army type men. They, they are uh, keen, uh, but, but perhaps not as active as they could be. There was a lot of pressure on uh, the war ministry to actually uh, allow them to, to proceed with this plan of this Dulwich Defence League. Uh, there was a shortage of rifles in the country. And of course, these 1,500 men all wanted to be armed with a rifle. There was um, a rifle ranges on Dulwich Common, and they were first of all, arranged by uh, the local doctor, Dr. Batten. And he was a member of the Dulwich and Sydenham Hill Golf Club. And a number of the people that were on the sort of planning committee, if you like, of the D Dulwich Defence League were indeed members of the Dulwich and Sydenham Golf Club. And of course, again, there's this uh, uh, extraordinary s s comparison, similarity in World War II when uh, the local home guard unit was formed by members of the Dulwich and Sydney Golf Club. And of course, their logbook now makes hilarious reading. But at the time, they felt they were they were doing their bit, as it were. Uh, and so here we are. And they uh, went to Hayes Common for manoeuvres. And here they are at Knockholt uh, in camp. You, can we go back one, Sir Sharon? Uh, you can see that some of them haven't even got uniforms yet. Uh, the, the uniforms cost three pounds, and they had to start collections, you know, uh, uh, fundraising to, to all get uniforms. So here are the officers. They look a little bit smarter. Um, the 
man on the right, whose name is uh, Gough Edwards, uh, he uh, was headmaster for a time at Rosendale Road School. He, his granddaughter is a member of the Dulwich Society today. There is their memorial uh, at St Peter's Churchyard on the corner of Dulwich Common and Lordship Lane. And the flagpole there is the flagpole that was used by the Dulwich Defence League. Um, and it was fixed outside their headquarters in this hall in Lordship Lane. That hall, which was actually on the corner of Woodvale, was actually bombed and destroyed in World War II. Now, a more serious uh, enterprise was conducted by this man, who was the MP for Dulwich, and his name was Frederick Hall, better known as Fred Hall. He was a very charismatic member of parliament, and the army council had approached the mayor of Camberwell, and I'm sure they approached other mayors of other boroughs, and had asked the mayor of Camberwell to equip and get volunteers for an artillery brigade. And an artillery brigade is about a thousand men. Well, Fred Campbell was so successful in his recruiting and outfitting that he managed to raise four brigades, which is a whole division of artillery. That's over 4,000 men. Uh, as you can see, 4,300 men. He got hold of 3,950 horses, 68 guns. And so he had three regiments of field artillery, which are these ones here. Here they are uh, in Lindhurst Grove. When the anniversary of World War II, World War I, sorry, um, was, was celebrated or commemorated, um, the Royal Horse Artillery did a little slightly scaled down, but reenactment of this scene that you see here today. Uh, that you see here, that, 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 so that was a, a, a modern reenactment. And here is another one of the, uh, that was known as the, the Camberwell Gun Brigade. And those sort of cannons you can see there are the ones that you might have seen by, by the Royal Horse Artillery today. Well, he started his campaign, Fred Hall started his campaign in March 1915. And in May 1915, he has enough men and equipment to have a recruiting parade drive all through the borough of Camberwell. And it came through Dulwich Village and the Reverend Canon Nixon, who was the uh, vicar of St Barnabas, encouraged the people to go out and watch the parade and the men to join. An indistinct picture, but if you get close enough to your screen, you're going to see it's possibly on um, blue screen. And here's another one. And this, I think, is probably this time on College Common, probably near the, the cricket field. Uh, up near St. Peter's Church. And here's one of the heavy guns in action, one of the brigade's heavy guns. The brigade were uh, trained up enough by August to go to Bulford Camp down in Hampshire. They embarked for France on the 13th of December and were in action on the front line before Christmas 1915. It was one of the fastest um, recruitments, training, and going into action that was um, that was come across in World War One. And the brigade fought at Arras and Passchendaele and Ypres 
because they were one of the first or the first brigade across no man's land, the borough of Camberwell was awarded one of the captured German howitzers uh, as a, a trophy of war. And here they are in action. The borough of Camberwell um, in World War I, and of course again in World War II, staged great big fundraising drives for men, equipment and, and, and weaponry. And here they're sitting on a tank, so it's got to be after 1916. And they're supported there by the band of the Boy Scouts, you can see sitting on the tank and the mayor in front with the other dignitaries. In 1914, the War Office designated certain civilian hospitals as military hospitals. And number four General Hospital, Royal Army Medical Corps, was located at the Morsley Hospital. And number one General Hospital, RAMC, was also in Camberwell, and it was at number one general hospital that um, Vera Britton was a nurse. Now, these hospitals that the War Office had designated were to support what were known as the stationary hospitals, that's the sort of permanent, as opposed to the tented field hospitals, and those stationary hospitals were located in northern France. But by 1915, the casualty rate was so high that the War Office had to look further for hospital accommodation for wounded and sick soldiers. And so some of the old poor law institution infirmaries were asked to play a part. And because of the introduction of the old age pension before the war and improvements in um, living standards and rising wages and the Rent Restriction Act, there was less demand for places in workhouses and consequently in workhouse infirmary. So there was space. So, the guardians of the poor of Southwark agreed to participate in the War Office scheme, and they cleared the patients, and there were not so many. And they were about, a, I think, 170 patients. Some were children, and they were moved either to an infirmary in Lambeth or to an another a poor law infirmary in Southwark, and the hospital was cleared. Now, the remaining staff, the existing staff, were kept on. And um, the medical officer, it, it, superintendent, who was Dr. Bruce, was put in uniform and appointed major and continued his work. And Dulwich, it became known as Southwark Military Hospital, and it had 800 beds fully equipped. And I'll give you some idea of the, the strength of it. Um, so there was um, point, there was a uh, 50 nursing sisters, 25 staff nurses, 59 probationers, 40 orderlies, and 55 Royal Army Medical Corps personnel. Dr. Batten, who I mentioned earlier from the Dulwich and Sydenham Golf Club, who was the one that arranged with the Dulwich Estate to get permission for a rifle range on golf course was the x-ray specialist. The local GP, Dr. Cartmail, who had his surgery in Dulwich Village, 
was an anaesthetist there. The hospital functioned as a military hospital for three and a half years. Towards the end of that time, it was bringing in empire troops, Australians. And in 1918 onwards, American troops were brought in. Altogether, 12,522 wounded and sick servicemen were treated at Southwark Military Hospital. And it is a credit to the nursing staff and the quality of care that of that number, uh, sad as it was, but only 112 actually died out of over 12,000. And the memorial that you see in this picture is still there today. At the moment, as we speak, it is boxed in uh, with protected protective, um, material because the building behind, which is the, the central block, mission block of the hospital, of course, as you probably know, is being restored for the use of the Charter School East College. And that will become, that memorial will become a feature as part of the new school. All the names of those men that died at the hospital are engraved upon that memorial. One of the nurses was a 19 year old from Blackpool called Joanna Swarbrick. And she had already had experience of nursing wounded soldiers. She was a, a VAD nurse, a voluntary aid <laughs> nurse. She kept a book, uh, a sort of a, an autograph book, if you like. And that is now in the Imperial War Museum. And you could go and look if you want. And in it, the soldiers would write uh, a little piece of poem, a remnant of poem that they remembered, or some thoughts that they had or they would make a drawing or they would put a little joke uh, about the, the nurse and so on. Um, one soldier wrote that he'd been wounded four times, once each in sort of 1915, 1916, 1917 and 1918, poor man. Uh, so Southwark Military Hospital continued until 1919. It then went back to becoming a uh, um, board of guardians workhouse infirmary until the um, workhouse system was abolished. The staff, again, the matron who had been there before the war, during the war, was retained after the war. Dr. Bruce, who had gone abroad to one of the stationary hospitals in France with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, returned to become superintendent. The Vicar of St. Barnabas, Barnabas would continue to be chaplain. And I should have mentioned that during the war, the congregation of St. Barnabas sent comforts to the troops, sent a snooker table, um, sent people, invited convalescent soldiers home for tea. So now we're going to look at some of the heroes, uh, local heroes. And one was Sidney Vincent Sippe. He was a professional aviator before World War I. He, he joined the Royal um, Naval Flying Service and flew an Avro monoplane. And he was selected with two other pilots and two other aeroplanes to fly 120 miles from France down to Frederickshaven, which is on Lake Constance, where the Zeppelins were being constructed and repaired. And it was a bombing raid. And in that little monoplane, they successfully bombed the Zeppelin sheds at Lake Constance. One of the planes got shot down, but the pilot managed to bail out and was made a prisoner of war. But the other two pilots, including Sipe, 
uh, were able to return to their airfield in France, a, a remarkable demonstration of navigation and, and courage and so on. Uh, for his bravery, he was awarded the DSO and then the OBE and the Croix de Guerre. A major Luden Shand was awarded the Victoria Cross. He lived in Alain Park. He led his troops up over the top of the trench. He was shot almost immediately. He fell back into the trench, but he lay there encouraging the men upwards to go forward uh, to, uh, to attack the enemy. And he was awarded a, a posthumous Victoria Cross for conspicuous bravery. Uh, Commander Gordon, Ca Commander Gordon Campbell, rather, was the son of Colonel Campbell, who was the commanding officer of the Dulwich Defence League. Um, and Commander Campbell here, Royal Navy, was in command of what was known as a Q ship. And now these were top secret in World War I. Uh, in World War I, the German U-boats um, were a menace. Germany had actually stopped competing in the race for naval supremacy with Britain. It realized it couldn't overtake or even equal um, Britain in naval supremacy. And instead, it turned its attention to developing U-boats, and they became a real threat to convoys and shipping. And so as a countermeasure, the Admiralty introduced Q ships, which were disguised merchantmen, heavily armed. So the guns on these Q ships were, were covered up and it just looked like a merchantman. Well, what happened to Commander Campbell's ship was that it was torpedoed by a, a, a German submarine. The German submarine then surfaced as the Q ship appeared to be sinking. It surfaced to sort of finish off the, the merchantman. But Colonel Ca Col Commander Campbell gave the order for all guns to be brought down to point blank range. And they had a lot of guns on this merchantman. And of course, they destroyed the U-boat. And they were able actually to keep the Q-ship afloat. And he went on to Colonel Cam, uh, Commander Campbell, rather, sorry, went on to command other Q-ships through the war. Uh, when he had his citation for his Victoria Cross um, listed in the London Gazette, no mention was made of cue ships. It was such a secret. But here are the unsung heroes. And here we see in Dulwich Village, the, the shop that you see here is owned, was owned by Mr. Core, Charles Core. He's on the right of that picture. The shop today has been rebuilt as Rumsey's Chemists. He had two sons, and um, the ones that he had, you can see in this picture, the younger one, um, let me get it right, was Cecil, and the older one was Charles. And the Cor Charles Corb was also a local builder. He was also a local artist. You might have come across some paintings, not fantastic, but they are by interesting and they're signed CB Core. Here are the two, his two sons again. So the younger one, Cecil on the left and the older one, Charles on the right. This was taken just a couple of months before they were both killed at different battles uh, around Arras in 1917. So the father had the terrible, um, 
blow of having one being killed in August and the other in the November at Passchendaele. You can see this taken in the back in their garden of the back of their house in Dulwich Village next to the graveyard. You can see those houses in Boxall Road, not Boxall Road, in Decker Road behind. The local blacksmith whose shop was only next door but one to Mr. Core, um, Mr. Evans was his name, and he was not only a blacksmith, but he was also a, a vet, and that is his son who's leading against the door, and that son was killed in World War II, in World War I. This is Private Shinkfield. He was the son of Shinkfield's ironmongers hardware. They had a shop in Dulwich Village. They had one, maybe more, in Lordship Lane. And this was the curate of St Barnabas, Dulwich. Um, he, this young man, um, whose name was Smith, spelt with, a, spelt with a Y, this was his engagement photograph. He was the young curate at St Barnabas, uh, but when war broke out, he felt his duty was to volunteer, so he volunteered as a medical orderly in the Royal Army Medical Corps. He served a year, and then his CO said to him, you know, really, you should be in the cha a chaplain's department. So he went to become in to the chaplain's department. He done, did another year as a army chaplain, and then he felt he still wanted to be closer to the men he was serving with, so he joined the artillery, Royal Garrison Artillery. In 1918, he received a leg wound, and it turned septic. He was shipped back to Dulwich and went into number four General Hospital, the Maudsley, and sadly he died in 1919. What happened at the end of the war was that the priests of the various parish churches opened up lists of uh, for those that were killed. And so that there was no sort of, um, a, it doesn't seem to have been any official record. People would just hand the vicar in the name, age and regiment of their loved one. And this is St. Stephen's War Memorial being consecrated. Um, now, at St. Barnabas, uh, sorry, we, we've gone on to, let's, can we just go back, show just one second. At St. Barnabas, the vicar there, that was Canon Nixon, he launched his appeal, he had the names come in, and Altogether, there were a total of 500 young men from college in the parish serving in the services in World War I. The parish of St Barnabas stretches from Half Moon Lane to Dulwich Common, north to south, and west to east from Croxted Road to Melbourne Grove. So it's not a huge area. So 500. Um, of the men of the parish served, and 85 were killed. So the death rate in Dulwich was 17% approximately. The national average of those that served was 10%. So you can see that the local men were early to volunteer and early to fall. So at St Barnabas, there were three boards of those that fell placed on the east wall, uh, sorry, on the um, north wall. The east, there was a new window put in the, on the east side, a great big window depicting the consolation of Christ. And the third thing that was done was to open a widow's fund. And 
that Reverend Smith, the curate who mentioned die from his wounds, his, his wife, a widow, was able to benefit and raise her daughter um, from that small pension that was able to be provided. Of course, when St. Barnabas burnt down in 1992, all of the memorial boards were burnt, the east window was destroyed. We do not know the names now of those young men from Dulwich that were killed. Can I just say a word about Nixon um, and also the Reverend Knott of St. Peter's? They were what were known as military priests. They encouraged their young men of the parish to do what they, the, the priest said was their duty, which was to enlist. And to encourage this, they printed, the, the both churches printed lists, which were issued monthly of all those, with the names of all those who were volunteering or already serving. And that list reached, as I said, 500 names. Eventually it got too big to keep publishing it monthly. And so by about 1917, uh, the list, a list, was just put up in St. Barnabas Church. Then, unlike the film of Saving Private Ryan, there was a couple of families which were, could be compared with them. And one of them was the Russell family. And the Russells had seven sons and two daughters and lived in Pong Cottages, and two of the sons were killed. And the vicar uh, expressed concern that the eldest, in fact, who hadn't been called up because he was a married man and of, of, of older age, he was also due to be called up, and there was, there was worries about him. But there was also an even bigger family, which was the Bartlett family. And the Bartlett's had a bookshop and stationery shop on the side of what is now Pedder's um, estate agents. They had eight sons. One son had already emigrated for, to Canada and joined the territorial army um, in Canada. He sailed back to England to join his brothers in the army in World War I. And again, two of his brothers were killed. And this is the war memorial of the first Surrey Rifles. And a wreath is laid every year. This is at St. Giles Camberwell. And this is an, if you like, a really odd epilogue. Uh, a few years ago, and I, I, I think I'm, it's about seven years ago, I received a phone call from uh, a prison officer from Wellingborough Prison in Northamptonshire to say that they had the, the prison was being closed down and they were clearing it out and clearing out the workshops and the metal workshops. And in the metal workshop, they found these three bronze plates, plaques. They are about four feet tall, each one, and possibly two, two and a half feet across. And he said that he'd been passed, they had passed these plaques onto the local Royal Air Force Association, and the Royal Air Force Association in North Hans had traced the names on these plaques back to Dulwich and to a non-conformist church, which turned out to be Christ Church in Barry Road. And the person that phoned me from Wellingborough Prison was keen that they had survived all this time from being put in a skip almost when the prison was cleared that they were actually still preserved and would 
the Dulwich Society do something perhaps about it. So we, we, we spoke about it and we said, yes, of course. So they were brought down from Northamptonshire and we approached the congregation of what is now Christ Church, uh, Barry Road. But it was a different congregation. Um, and sadly, they didn't really want to know very much about these plaques, that what they said was that they had combined with a Methodist church in Barry Road and had prepared a book with the names in, and they didn't know what had happened to the plaques. So when the former Emmanuel Church or Christ Church in Barry Road was bought, eventually passed down to, I think, to the Home Office. Uh, I approached the people at the uh, Home Office, Barry Road, which is there now for refugees, and they readily agreed to put them back. And so perhaps it's um, just uh, a thought that memorials are not always forever, but this one here, so these local men whose names, some of them, one I recognize from their, their sons and grandsons on it, um, that has a fitting place uh, still on the walls of the same church to which they attended and which today is caring for refugees, much as many people in Dulwich had cared for Belgian refugees in 1914.